those of you who know my family know that we often go up to the UP, Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And uh, people always ask, well, where? Because everybody has their spots up north, right? And ours is right over the bridge, 45 minutes west on Route 2. And uh, we have run at a place there for years, uh, actually since I was little. And um, we just love going up there, and maybe many of you do as well. But one of the beautiful things we love about it is the stargazing, right? And so my brother Mark has a wonderful camera. He's a, a photographer. And so one evening we went, in the, and you can imagine how beautiful the stars were. Well, actually, you don't need to imagine. You can see this picture. So my brother took this picture. We just sat in the middle of this dirt road in the middle of nowhere, UP, and uh, in the, just in the evening and just sat and viewed the stars. Uh, thankfully, there were no you know, bears or other uh, animals, at least as far as we know, also viewing the stars nearby that night. But you can see this beautiful, beautiful picture that uh, I have in various places um, and, and look at all the time because I just remember that feeling of awe and majesty and just feeling like I'm this teeny tiny little speck and here's all of God's glory. And again, maybe you think, oh, well, that's pretty sad because you're feeling like, oh, you're nothing. But it's actually, for me, totally the opposite that I can sit there and view just a small portion, actually, of God's wonder, but yet I still know that God knows be my name, that God has every one of my hairs on my head counted, that, that he knows me intimately and hears me. And again, that's true for every single one of us. So to me, the more that we see the expanding universe and we try to even begin to comprehend, comprehend its expanse, to me, that makes it even more special that, that Jesus came here among us and that God knows each and every one of us and loves each and every one of us. Well, I want to start with a quick science quiz today because we're going to be talking about space, about stars. In our solar system, what is the order of the planets from smallest to largest? In our solar system, what is the order of the planets from smallest to to largest. So if, if you think you know, you're welcome to type that in uh, if you're on Facebook. But otherwise, just take a minute and think about that. I'm guessing most of us probably know the smallest planet. Anybody know the smallest planet? Mercury, right? And I'm guessing most of us know the largest planet, Jupiter. But the order in between maybe is going to be difficult. So did anybody come up with that uh, as far as you know? Well, let me give it to you just in case, and, and you can see the slide that has all the different size ratios. The order of planets from smallest to largest, Mercury, Mars, Venus, Earth, Neptune, Uranus, Saturn, Jupiter. So there they are. And I found a really kind of a fun way of, of remembering these, a mnemonic device, right? I think it's called. Mercury met Venus every night until Saturn jumped. So if you can remember that, you've got some of the planets in there, plus the first letter, obviously, uh, met would be for Mars, right? Mercury met Venus every night until Saturn jumped. So when you win on Jeopardy, remember Haskins Community Church. So 93 million miles away from us is our sun. The sun is a pretty big star, but it's nowhere near as big as some of the other stars that we know about. Did you know there is a star that is five billion times the size of our sun? You all know that we are part of the Milky Way galaxy and that there are trillions of stars in our galaxy and all of them are circled by at least one planet such as our own. You probably know that within our Milky Way galaxy we are not the only solar system. So far astronomers, you might not know this, so far astronomers have found over 500 solar systems and are dis discovering new ones every year. Scientists estimate that there are tens of billions of solar systems in our galaxy alone. Are, is your mind starting to, right? Through the Hubble telescope, we have been able to see a very small slice of space and it shows hundreds of galaxies. 500 billion light years away from us is something called the cosmic web where billions and billions of galaxies, just like our galaxy, reside. Billions. And that is our universe. 
But what is beyond our universe? You know what? Scientists believe that there are other universes besides ours. Compared to the eternal heavens, we are smaller than we can ever begin to imagine. Consider this. Did you, I'm sure you probably heard this before, but there are more stars in the universe that are our universe than there are grains of sand on all the beaches on the earth. Wow. And yet, and yet, the God who created all of this and controls all of this down to the smallest microscopic particles took on flesh and became one of us. As incomprehensible as it seems, the cosmic eternal Christ, the pre-existing word, remember our reading from John 1, who was, was also a flesh and blood person, who was born to a particular woman in a particular town at a particular time and died a painful physical death. This incomprehensible mystery is what we mean when we talk about the central theme of Christmas, that God became one of us, God with us, Emmanuel. The one who shouted, let there be light, came to us in Jesus. The word, the creative power and the wisdom of God that spoke all things into existence, that spoke and things came to be took on flesh as an infant in Bethlehem. Okay, second quick quiz, but this one's a lot easier than the first one. What are the first words in the Bible? Genesis 1.1 starts, yes, in the beginning, in the beginning. And did you notice, though, that John begins our scripture reading that we shared the same? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. In Genesis 1, God creates all that is by speaking. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. He spoke those words, and it came into being. As God speaks, everything comes into be. In John chapter 1, Jesus is described as the word. As John says, all things came into being through him, and without him, not one thing came into being. And because of this, the relationship between God and humanity has been forever altered. In speaking of Christ, John writes, again looking at our scripture today, in him was life, and that life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And here lies our hope. The twin realities of darkness and light permeate the Bible. The Bible's beginning and end highlight the tension between darkness and light with the power of light coming from God. And darkness is most often associated with evil, adversity, ignorance, despair, gloom, death. We decide whether we will walk in the darkness or the light. It's a choice that we make. In the meantime, the light shines. No matter what choice we make, the light is still there. Just like when we go away from God and we say, oh, where is God? God is always right next to us. It's us that pull away. And then as soon as we just call to him, we see that he's been there the whole time. Think about that footsteps poem that we probably all know. This light, then Jesus, became flesh and makes a home among us, giving humankind a well-lit room in that house and a clear vision of the pathways to enlarging and enhancing peace, enlarging the houses of God that we create for all people. In John chapter 3, Jesus says, this is the verdict, light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But everyone who wants to walk in the truth comes into the light. So a third question today, which is it do you love? Who do you love? What do you love? The light or the darkness? Do you love what it is that you do so much that you really would never want anybody to know and you'd never really even put it on Facebook? 
and you would never even want to admit it to your best friend, maybe certain things that we do or that we say or that we feel inside, that's the darkness. And again, then we, we look at that and we say, do I love that darkness so much that, I, that I'm not going to come to Jesus, that I'm not going to embrace the light? Or am I willing to put away all those things that I know I shouldn't be doing or saying or acting that way or thinking? Do we put those dark things away to let Jesus open us up to his light, to his love, to his goodness? The temptation to sin is strong, but you know what? The light is stronger still. For as we are told in verse 5 of our gospel lesson this morning, the light shines in the darkness, just like a single candle. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There is a good path that God intended from the beginning for us to walk, and that path is described in the scripture as walking in the light. Think about it again when you're walking outside, you're walking even in your house and all the lights are off, right? What do you do? You bump into things, right? You step on the dog's tail, right? But when there's light, even one small candle or one small emergency light maybe that you have plugged in, electricity goes out, you still can see with that one light. And that, again, is representative of the light of Jesus. When we stray from the path, though, we move toward darkness. When we succumb to thoughts or words or deeds that bring, bring perhaps, again, momentary gratification, followed by hurt, we walk in darkness. The battle between good and evil, light and darkness, is one of the major themes of human existence, right? I bet you could think of ten movies right now. Star Wars, the first one, maybe, that you could think of. That, that, that try to depict this struggle. <clears throat> and it's not just a battle that's fought outside of us, it's a battle fought within us. There is, of course, another kind of darkness, and this is not moral darkness, although it's sometimes the result of bad decisions or, or evil actions on the parts of others, but this darkness is associated with grief, sadness, or despair, or the feelings of being lost or unloved. We all know what this means because we have all been there in one way or another. Perhaps maybe especially this year. Maybe perhaps especially right now as Christmas is just around the corner. But my friends, there is hope. John's telling of the Christmas story is rooted in the creation story and aims to make clear the cosmic significance of Jesus becoming one of us. And that happened as God's response to all the darkness. When God speaks, everything comes into being. And Jesus is the word of God. Remember our reading again, the word. As you know, each week of Advent, we light another candle in the Advent wreath, kind of like that video that you just had seen before the sermon. The closer we come to Christmas, the greater the light. Until finally on Christmas Eve, we light the Christ candle, and celebrate that the light of the world has been born into our world. Again, if you haven't had a chance, run over to Michael's or Hobby Lobby. Put a not today, Hobby Lobby is closed. Um, but run over and get that fifth candle if you haven't had that, so that you have a candle here um, as this one to light on, on Christmas Eve to remind you and keep it with you all year long. Even if you put the other four away of your Advent wreath, keep that Christ candle. That's what brings us hope and salvation and meaning. The light of the world was born into our world. In John's Gospel, though, Jesus tells his disciples, I am the light of the world. Again, we, we've been told that. But in Matthew, Jesus turns to his disciples and says, You, you are the light of the world. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Again, when we see that single candle, and then we see those words, you are the light of the world. Jesus is the light, and as we come to him, trust in him, and begin to follow him, we walk in the light as well. We have his light within us. We become the light in this dark, dark world. And again, what does that mean? It means we love God. How do we show love for God? By loving 
our neighbor, our cosmic neighbor. Yes, loving our literal neighbor, but loving our friends, loving our family, loving strangers in the grocery store, loving all those people who live in another town, another state, another country. We do this by offering food to the hungry, caring for the sick, encouraging others, giving clothing to those who are without, a drink to the thirsty, and love to those who feel unloved. And again, that's all those categories, right? We all know people in our lives, and we all maybe are those people that are feeling unloved. So we have two choices. We can sit in our homes and go, boy, nobody cares about me. I haven't gotten a card from anybody. Nobody cares about me. I am so unloved. And then, of course, that spirals, right? God doesn't love me. Look at how he's letting me be you know, here and, and all these things that are happening. Or we can switch that around, can't we? And we can say, the light of Christ is in me, and I'm going to show people that light. And I don't care if this person didn't send me a card. I'm going to send them a card with an encouraging note. I'm going to call them. I'm going to bake cookies and drop them off uh, on their, uh, at their home, ring the bell, and, and leave it there. I'm going to go Christmas caroling outside um, you know, with my family unit, and I'm going to go and share the good news of Christ. There's so many things we can do. I'm going to let this person cut in, in, ahead of me in line. I'm going to do everything I can to show the light of Christ. And you know what? At that point, we also, right, are getting the light thrown back to us because we are sharing that light, and we have an inner glow then because of that. God's healing does spring up quickly when we help heal the hurt and brokenness in others. And again, we receive healing as well. When we share the light of Christ, we also receive it. That's how it works. We feed ourselves when we feed others. We love ourselves when we love others first. We serve God in ourselves when we serve others. It is true that compared to the eternal heavens, we are smaller than we could ever know. But the stronger truth is that no matter how small we are compared to this vast universe, God so loves us. God so loves you, each of us, that he came into this world, put on flesh and blood, and became one of us so that we might come to know just a bit of who he is, what he is about. And through his death and resurrection, we might be saved from darkness, sin, and death. The light that enlightens everyone has come into the world. That's what we celebrate in Advent. But do we recognize the one who has entered our midst? Have we really fully received him for who he is? And again, if you want to have a conversation about that, call. Call the church office. Leave a message. Um, email uh, the, the, uh, the church office. And again, you, you can see that on our website or here on the, the, the contact slides of before and after our services. Feel free, to, again, to contact me, and I'll, I'll listen to you. I can, I can you know, support you. Have you received Jesus fully for who he is? And again, you don't need me. As soon as service is over or right this very moment as we're praying, you can do that. You can make that prayer. There's no specific magical words to be said. Open up your heart sincerely, and Jesus will hear you and will love you. Will we be born this Advent and Christmas season with the one who has been born in a manger? Will we let our light of peace and love shine so that we inspire others to do the same? I pray that it is so. Amen.
Please join me in prayer. 